All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, so this link will bring us to um, a lecture. It's probably going to be a little bit of a long lecture. We're going to try to cover some basic brief things about solution-focused brief therapy, and then I want to go into a more specific uh, approach um, called motivational interviewing. And so I'll talk about the basic components of MI, how it links to the concepts of solution-focused therapy, uh, and then at the end I have a case presentation of a client that I worked with who we used MI with. MI is the abbreviation for motivational interviewing. So I'll talk a little bit about that case, how we applied the method, um, and how that increased uh, the success of it. So I'm going to open up really quickly a PowerPoint here. I'm hoping that it works. It was a, uh, that when I transferred it onto the Mac, it seemed like there might have been some, a few little issues. Let me just get rid of my face. But we'll go through this. All right, and if you have any questions, um, I'll open up a discussion board. Feel free to ask those questions there or bring them to our next class. So I start with this uh, quote by Kurt Lewin. Uh, if you want to try to understand something, try to change it. Uh, and that's sort of the, the basic concept of the solution focus is that even in the attempts to discover and name the solution, um, progress is made, right? So insight is gained into the understanding of the problem itself, but also into the um, resources that the person has available. So when we're doing solution-focused brief therapy, that's the SFBT, um, there are some main beliefs that we bring into the work. And the first is that even when people are not doing well, pieces of the solution are happening, right? So this is kind of a strength-based concept that uh, even in the darkest moments, there is something that is working for the person. Even if it's maladaptive, uh, it is working. So when we're trying to look at those things, uh, trying to come up with a solution, co-creating a solution with a client, uh, it's important to recognize what they are doing that's successful. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with people in the field of substance use, uh, at the end of hearing their stories, I'll often say, well, it's, it sounds like it's a good thing that you found the drug um, because it actually helped you to be able to get to where we are now, but it also sounds like maybe the drug isn't working anymore. You want to try something different. So you can build on um, the things that have worked, even if they're maladaptive. Uh, so the other belief, by changing small problems, we affect the big problems. This is sort of, you can imagine a wind chime. If you touch one of the chimes, it tends to affect all of the chimes. So if somebody is struggling with um, uh, getting to work on time and you realize that part of the problem is that they don't pre-buy their Metro card, if you can get them to a place where they're, they have a stored Metro card, by solving that one problem, you help them get to the larger issue, right? Um, or if they're getting into fights with their parents before they leave for school every morning um, and then they're late for school, if you actually work on the relationship and communication styles with the parents, then getting to school on time will probably start to work itself out, right? Uh, the third belief that, that the client is already doing something that works and that we wanna build on those things that are working. Uh, we wanna talk about the positive parts of the client's life uh, we want to reframe things in a strengths um, perspective because we know that that builds self-worth, it creates optimism, uh, and begins a change process that starts with the existing strengths and resources. Let's begin with what we have. A lot of times when we're dealing with clients with a lot of stress and anxiety in their life, putting something new on their plate just creates more anxiety. But if there's already something on the plate that we can draw their attention to that they can already use, sometimes it's a little bit easier. Um, but so we do make some assumptions in solution focused brief therapy. Uh, one of, is about the nature of people, that people are free to make their choices. They're not victims of their genetics or environment. Um, language is key here because we do understand that people are held back uh, by environment and genetics can have a strong predisposition. But what solution focused therapy wants to do is really look at how even with those stressors, can we accomplish goals? Can we create change? Can we solve problems even if those other things are there? Um, the other assumption is that people are basically good, people are basically rational, that people respond better to here and now and future counseling orientations. This is sort of where SFBT comes into conflict sometimes with uh, more traditional psychoanalytic principles that want to gain insight into the past so that people can have a more grounded present and make uh, sort of clean decisions into the future, clean meaning devoid of uh, the clutter of the past. Um, people have the ability to work through their own problems. That's a really huge uh, 
principle. And if you think about our ethical canon, a lot of these things follow along with that, right? So with the social work values that these resonate with. So I'm gonna ask you to look at this slide and then later answer this question in the, the discussion board. On which, what social values, value or values does this slide particularly resonate with? So our components of SFBT. Um, so the, what we wanna do about, almost above all else is develop a working alliance to address the problem. We want the client to really feel like we are with them on this journey. Not that we're a sort of the expert, we're not even like sort of the Sherpa, we're not even the guide. We're at working as a partner in the alliance. They bring what they have, which is uh, their suffering, their understanding of the suffering, and what they've been doing with it so far to, to manage it. And then we bring in our expertise um, and our own understanding of, of the problem in the world and resources and access and availability to things that may be able to be brought into the problem solving process. So we develop the working alliance, we identify the strengths and that builds our foundation. Uh, it increases their confidence and, and hopefully unlocks an ability that change is possible. And then we implement active and eclectic counseling strategies and interventions. We'll get to some of those in a bit. Then we establish clear, clear concrete, measurable goals in order to evaluate the prog progress. Because SFPD is a, an evidence-based practice, there, are, uh, there is a necessity to evaluate um, to make sure that what you're doing is working because that also makes sure that you're doing the evidence base the right way. So our interventions are doing something different. A lot of times uh, people get caught up in what some people call insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, hoping it'll be different. Um, with SFBT, one of our goals is to get people to try different approaches to solving the problem. Um, there's an old saying, if every problem looks, uh, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So in SFBT, we literally want to increase the tools that people feel they have access to. Um, one of the ways that we do this is to look for exceptions. Uh, when somebody is telling you that something always happens, sometimes reframing and saying always, has there ever been a time that it hasn't happened this way? Has there ever been a time when it did work out? And then you start to pick apart that. Well, what was different about that? What do you think uh, is still there that you could use now. You know, and pay attention to what you do when you overcome the urge to blank. That's a really great one for folks who are dealing with uh, things that have a high probability of reoccurrence or relapse. Being able to see, well, when you were, uh, you know, craving that or when you were drawn towards doing, taking that action, but you didn't, what did you do? Uh, instill hope based in past success. You know, tell me about a time when you had a good day. Tell me about the days when the dark clouds of depression aren't there. You know, what's happening in those moments? And, and, can, and just by recognizing that those moments exist, we can understand that they will come around again. So it's a future orientation. When we're talking about clients who have suicidal ideality, oftentimes we're trying to help them see that there is tomorrow and that tomorrow may be different. So we want to reframe setbacks as new data, right? So observe and take notes. That means somebody relapses on drugs, we don't flip out. We talk to them about what, what we can learn from that experience. How do we take the data of that relapse and turn it into new interventions? So our counseling method, so orientation. The first thing that we do is we wanna to clarify to them that we're using SFBT. We wanna tell them a little bit about what this counseling process looks like. Uh, then we start to set the goals. We elicit from the client the definition of their own problem. Uh, the feelings, this is where we start to dig a little. We want to know about the feelings associated with the problem. We want to get away from just qualitative. We want to get them into some quantitative stuff. So we ask them to identify the intensity of the feelings. Scaling is a big part of solution-focused brief therapy. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is it? On a scale of 1 to 10, how good is it? Um, the client's expectations of what they want to have happen in counseling so that we can make sure that their expectations can be managed by our our clinic, our intervention, things like that, um, and the goals that they want to accomplish within a specific amount of time. Uh, how we get these things is we constantly do the active listening, which is where you know we give uh, audible clues that we're there, like nodding our heads, sounds like mm-hmm, yeah, okay, and, you know things like that. We use scaling a lot. So where are you on a scale of one to ten? If somebody comes in and says I'm just feeling so depressed, I'm going to say all right, scale of one to ten, one being the best you felt, 10 being the worst, where are you today? Uh, and then we want to work with positive and negative goals, right? So, um, you know, 
sometimes they're going to present something that we don't view as helpful, but we want to work around those concepts as well because it's really about exploration um, and helping them get to make the decisions that they want to make for themselves. So what makes a good goal? It means that the client owns as much of it as you do. Uh, if the client needs assistance, you want to make sure that the goals are co-created. So if the client can't think of something, you don't want to keep pushing and pushing. You can offer something in. Um, sometimes I like to <coughs> say, you know, what some other people have tried was this. Does it sound like it would work for you? Uh, set your goals that are behaviorally oriented simply because that's part of this model, but also because those are a little bit easier for people to identify rather than more abstract, nuanced um, uh, goal achievement, right? Um, so if somebody has a goal of driving a car, uh, you know, they may start feeling better about the idea of driving, but that's hard to quantify. But if they go and get their application, if they go and get their the permit, those types of things you can gauge really easily. It's easier to evaluate. Um, goals work best when they're positive, concrete, and reduced to small steps. So those of you who are interested in cognitive behavioral therapy, you hear a lot about partialization, breaking down um, Breaking down, they, a lot of times I hate the term, but they say you can't eat an elephant in one bite. Uh, I say the same thing about a hummus wrap, but, uh, but that idea of like, you, but you can't eat it one bite at a time. So we want to break things down into small steps that are achievable. We want to state our goals in terms of what behavior will occur. Um, again, because that's the easiest to evaluate how often it will occur and under what conditions it will occur. So if you're trying to get somebody to go to a self-help meeting, um, you know, you, it could be that, uh, you know, on Friday at 11 o'clock, client will um, attend the Grow and Get Better AA meeting at 3642 Mockingbird Lane with their sponsor, Joe S. All right, so you want to give those, those really specific things within the goal uh, so that it's easier to measure and it's easier to break down why it didn't work. They come back and they said, I didn't go to the AA meeting. Well, what happened? out of all the steps in our goals, well, my sponsor didn't go, I felt uncomfortable going by myself. Now you have something to work on, which is that, you know, fear of not being included or whatever going in by themselves meant to them in that moment. So a couple of the methods we use, we love the miracle question. Uh, should a miracle occur this evening while you're sleeping? And when you woke up, you suddenly realized that your problems were solved. What would you be doing that would indicate to you that the miracle had actually taken place? So that's always a fun one, um, and it, it, it elicits a level of creativity, curiosity. Uh, there's no way for it to be wrong, but it's also naming behavior, right? So it's not like, what would you notice? How would you feel? What would you be doing that would indicate that it had actually taken place? Uh, you can also do that with relationships. What will your mother say that will be different after the miracle? <clears throat> How would your wife react to you after the miracle had taken place? Um, and other methods, asking and reinforcing the exceptions to the problem situation. So when somebody tells you, a really good example, I had a client who, uh, because of the way that he grew up, he had a belief that if anybody ever hit him, he had to hit them back. And he had a five-year-old son. And I said, is that for everybody? There's no flexibility in there? And he said, no, anybody puts their hands on me, I have to hit them back. And I said, so if your son was on your lap and he just hauled off and punched you, you'd have to fight him? And he said, of course not. I would never hit my kid. I said, all right, so there, there are some exceptions to this rule about somebody puts their hands on me, I have to fight them back. And, so, and he said, yeah, of course, there's exceptions. But so right there in that moment, it might not seem like a big deal, but we created flexibility within a belief system. That actually gives the client options the next time somebody touches them, right? That they know that they don't, they're not fixated, they're not stuck into that rule. Um, so that, that's helpful. And then using positive blame. So uh, when somebody does something really good, you blame them for it, <laughs> right? Like, so a lot of times at AA, someone will say, oh, it's not me, it's, it's God in the program. And I'll say, yeah, but you had to show up and you had to get on your knees. You had to activate those tools that were already there. That was you. That's your fault you got better, right? So it's the use of positive blame. Uh, so the counseling methods, again, we talk a lot about scaling, um, not just like how are you feeling, but progress towards the goal. So if somebody has a goal of going back to college and you go through all the processes and say there's 10 steps to get there, uh, you can scale them, right? So, so right now you're at one. Uh, you know, once the application is filed in financial aid, you'll be at three. So you can help people scale through that process. Um, asking them for what 10% improvement would be would, is always great. 
if somebody comes in and they say, you know, my anxiety is at an eight today, uh, you know, what would it take to get it down to a, a seven, right? Um, flagging the minefield is a great tool right at the end of sessions. You say what things might prevent you from moving up 10% on the scale or what might sabotage your plan? What would lower you 10%? So you just start to, this is traditionally what they call relapse prevention. Um, but you're just kind of trying to figure out, like you can't plan for everything, but uh, if you can put into your awareness that challenges are a part of change, uh, one, it normalizes that, but two, it also helps them kind of identify them when they do come up. Uh, and then when you're closing the session, a nice thing to do, not everyone does this, but writing them in a little note. So you write the client a message with like three compliments and a bridging statement um, from each compliment to one of the tasks. So uh, you could say, you know, Bob, you've been sober for eight and a half months and you're doing such an amazing job of following the steps. Um, you know, this week, take that confidence with you into that new meeting you're going to, right? So you attach it to that thing, you bridge it to the next one. Um, yeah. Uh, the five question method that these are, you're going to see a lot of these in this presentation, just different ways of asking or referring to specific things. So uh, asking folks, you know, Bob, how do you experience your drinking? Because a lot of times someone will come in and be like, oh, you know, my wife is, or my husband or my partner is telling me that I have to quit drinking. Uh, but it's their problem. It's not mine. And so I always like to say, okay, well, how do you experience your drinking? You know, tell me how they're wrong. You know, ask uh, when do or did you not experience the problem? Like, this is a different way of asking when it started. Like, can you remember the last time that this wasn't causing an issue in your relationship? Um, what, was, what was different then, right? You have them rate their current progress on solving the problem, zero to 10. Ask the miracle question, set the goals based on increasing what works. You don't want to keep, if somebody keeps coming back and saying, I hate AA, I hate AA, send them somewhere else. Send them to a different thing. Um, you don't want to make people feel like they're not being heard when they're giving you important data. So the benefits, it's got a wide appeal among cultures and clients who emphasize individual responsibility over family and community. Um, the approach has a lot to offer counselors who are working under strengths of managed care because it take, tends to be a faster form of treatment. Um, and then the methods of SFBT are really easy to master. Uh, so it, it lends itself to, especially early counselors within their practice, um, it lends itself to that really effectively. Uh, so the next section, and this is the longer section, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on a specific type of this uh, solution-focused brief therapy called motivational interviewing. Um, so what is it? It's a directive, person-centered counseling style that aims to help people explore and resolve their ambivalence about behavior change. So this is a really great method for folks who are on the fence. A lot of times those are the clients that are frustrating for us because we feel like, oh my gosh, why can't you just make a decision? But in motivational interviewing, ambivalence is gold. When somebody doesn't know it, whether they want to do something or not, that's when this approach is the most effective. Um, so it's a great place to start, especially with young people. Uh, we talked in our last class about the motivational regions of the brain and why during adolescence those are the areas to target rather than just focusing on the cognitive areas. Um, so we start with MI because it's a, it's a wonderful way to meet someone where they're at. It, the evaluation tools that we'll get to in a little bit help you really understand where they are in their change process, and that immediately lends itself to a solution. Um, so MI integrates principles, spirits, and methods for working with people. We'll get into what those are. Uh, it has simple and easy to use applications. I'm going to be giving you one. I'm going to upload um, uh, an exercise that you can do from MI called uh, value cards, which is really, really fantastic. And a lot of the things that are in this PowerPoint you'll be able to apply tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, provides clinical interventions based on the individual stage of change, which we'll get to in a bit. Its evidence base is enormous. Uh, it's considered one of the most important evidence-based practices uh, from SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, uh, which sets down a lot of the protocols for treatment. Um, so what some of the things that are a benefit to us is that it gives us more realistic expectations because all the um, responsibility is placed on the client uh, if they're able to respond to it, right? So we're really gauging a person's capacity and making sure that the interventions really match what they're capable of doing um, and where they are in their change process. Uh, we get to celebrate the small stuff. 
um, it shows that even though there might be struggles in the beginning phases, uh, that there's greater success achieved over time. Uh, for us, there's less frustration and burnout because we're not feeling so responsible for the change. We're just trying to help people uh, own more and more of their own life. Uh, this is a, one of the evidence-based practices that does appear to work across populations and cultures. Uh, it actively involves the person in their own care, improves adherence and retention, not just to showing up to meetings, but we can use this for you know, folks who are struggling with whether or not to take their medication, uh, whether or not to call their support networks. Um, it gives us a, a really good template and framework to teach them ways to make their own decisions. Uh, it instills hope because you are constantly celebrating the small stuff. And it's consistent with the mental health recovery transformation process, which is really crucial. So the components of the MI spirit, this is sort of the underlying philosophy is that this approach is collaborative, evocative, and autonomous, meaning that we're working in a partnership that the ideas and the solutions come from our client, not from us, and autonomy that the decisions and the consequences are left to our client themselves. Um, so the motivation to change is elicited from them, not from the outside. This is sometimes hard, especially with clients who've been mandated to treatment for us to find their intrinsic motivation, because oftentimes they're coming here because, you know, I got a nudge from the judge or they took my kids. It's the only way I can get them back. But you can break those things down to, okay, so you don't want to be involved in the criminal justice system anymore, or, okay, so you want to get back to parenting your children. You know, you, so you can look for their motivation within the external stuff, right? Um, and the, the next bit of spirit is that it's their task, not ours, to articulate and resolve ambivalence. So in this situation, the best MI counselors have the best questions, the worst have the best answers. So we really want to be asking evocative questions to get people to start to think and self-motivate themselves through the thought process. Direct persuasion is not effective for resolving ambivalence. It actually just creates resistance. Uh, our style is generally quiet and eliciting, so we're, we're a safe space for them to explore and we ask really good questions. Uh, the counselor is directive only in helping them to examine and resolve the ambivalence. We'll talk about getting, how do you get to that in a bit. The readiness to change is a fluctuating product of interpersonal interaction. So this is helpful when you know you think you did really, really great work, but then they get into a fight with their best friend and it's like nothing happened. That um, interpersonal interactions force fluctuation. They might be really motivated to do the work with you, but not as motivated to do it out there. And that's just something to, to re-explore, right? Uh, the therapeutic relationship is a partnership. There is no expert recipient role. It's, it's really two people working on a common issue. Um, we guide more than direct. We dance rather than wrestle. We listen as much as we tell. Uh, we collaborate conversations. We evoke from the person what they already have and we honor their autonomy. So this is, I mean, this should sound like the uh, NASW code of ethics, right? Like we are really taking this method and um, allowing it to occur in a really social work focused way. So what we know about motivation, why, why does this method work? We know that motivation is fundamental to change. They did a lot of studies to come up with this answer, but when someone is motivated to do something, they're more likely to do it. The other piece is that it fluctuates, right? Like you could, you could be going to the gym every day and then, you know, all of a sudden something happens and you're not as motivated as you used to be, right? Um, but even as it fluctuates, it can be modified. So that's the other important thing is to help people recognize how do I motivate myself when it's fluctuating in a downward place? How can I modify it? Uh, it's influenced by external factors and social interactions. So we can understand that Sometimes motivation is, is influenced by systems of oppression, racism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, all of these different things, these social interactions that occur in our life and these social pressures uh, can influence the motivation that a person has. Um, it's incredibly sensitive to interpersonal style. So that means their interpersonal style as it connects with our interpersonal style. Um, we know that there are internal and external sources. I, I like to think about motivation like superheroes, if anyone is familiar with the character Tarzan, which is an unbelievably problematic character, but um, Tarzan runs through the forest, he grabs a vine, he swings, and that's his motivation, right? He grabs that external motivator of the vine 
and he starts to swing. And he's good as long as there's another vine there. There's another external source of uh, motivation, right? So he has to reach out for the other one. Otherwise, he's just sort of stranded in the middle of the woods swinging on his vine. Um, Spider-Man is an upgrade, right? Spider-Man's vines are inside of him, but he still has to kind of point at it and connect that internal motivation to an external source, like a building or a crane or a bad guy. Um, Superman's the ultimate, right? Or Supergirl. Um, they, they have it all built in and they can just sort of fly and move in the direction that they need to go in. That's uh, sort of internalized motivation at its finest. So we're, we're looking to help people take the skills and the strengths of external motivation and start to internalize those into their own unique uh, motivation. That's sort of what we mean when we say to the person who says they're there because of a court order, being able to say, okay, so you don't want to be involved in the criminal justice system anymore, right? Now we're taking that external motivation of getting in trouble and we're internalizing it in a liberating way of staying away from the systems that are hurting them. Uh, and by doing these types of things, the big goal is to increase the probability that they're going to do it, that they're going to change it. Uh, and that motivating a person is part of what we do, especially as a motivational interviewing therapist. So for the rest of the, the, this section of the PowerPoint, before we get to the case study, I want you to think of a behavior in your own life that you have tried to change. I'll give you a minute to think about it. Okay, that was not a minute, but I think you should have one. Uh, so how much time elapsed between the first time you engaged in that behavior and the first time you realized negative consequences? Probably a while, right? It's like a lot of times people come in with problems that they've been dealing with for years and years and years. And sometimes we need to remember that there was a time when it wasn't a problem. And that odds are the first time that they didn't did it, they probably didn't receive the intensity of consequences that they have now. Otherwise, there might not have been a second time, right? So how much time elapsed between the first time you realized those negative consequences and the first time you tried to change the behavior? So again, this should sort of normalize this process, that even though you might think something's negative, it can still take a while before you decide to do something about it. And then how many of you had some success in changing that behavior? some success, but then how many of you experienced a relapse or an increase in the behavior after achieving some success? Right. So this is a normal part of the process. It doesn't mean anybody failed, um, but normalize this to yourself because when you're dealing with folks who have really complex problems, it's very easy to like over pathologize their experience and forget that a lot of this comes down to this fluctuating nature of motivation this fluctuating nature of insight and identification of a problem and how, you know, problems that last a long time become more corrosive. Right? So use this example as we continue to discuss the approach. So the fundamental guidelines of MI, this is, this, these are the things that you really want in your mind as you're doing the work. You want to resist the writing reflex. I think about this like when you see people trying to help a young person learn to ride a bicycle and, you know, you start to see them tip over and you want to stop them, but you know that tipping over is part of how they find their balance. So it's, it's sort of this, we've got to feel free and open to allow people to experience the imbalance of making decisions. Now this doesn't mean if they say, you know, I'm going out drinking tonight that you're like, okay, go drink tonight. No, but you'll explore it in a way that makes the decision theirs. At the end of it, if they still go decide to go out and engage in the behavior, you want to know that they're at least doing it with a, a clearer understanding of all of the pieces that are involved, right? Um, we want to work to understand their individual motivation, like what really, really moves them. That's their currency, right? That's, that's the, the cash that they use to ex in exchange in their lives. With young people, it's oftentimes relationships. That relationships will motivate them much more than their future success or anything like that. And so if you understand that that's their motivation, social connections and identity, well, then that helps you figure out what your interventions need to look at, look like. And the only way we get to that is number three, which is to listen. And if we listen and we really hear their intrinsic motivation and we help them explore this process, it's very easy to empower them to make the decisions that they're kind of sitting on. 
So, the, and how we do this is we want to see a process where the extrinsic becomes intrinsic, right? So the goal is to get them to the point where they're saying, I am changing because I want to, right? Um, so how we do that is we know, we want to know and explore what their values are. So I'm going to upload the value card exercise. I encourage you all to uh, team up with someone. Maybe we'll even do this in one of the classes and go through it so you can see how powerful it is. Um, core value discrepancy motivates change. So when we, once we know what their values are, if you go through the value exercise and their number one value is um, uh, friendship, right? Or yeah, love or friendship, something along those lines. And yet they're, you know, backstabbing their best friend. You could say something like, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because I know that your main value is friendship and yet it sounds like you're treating your best friend poorly. And I'm just wondering where, what's, what lives inside of that, that discrepancy? Right? What makes it more important for you to do the thing that you're doing that's hurting your friend? What makes that more important than your core value in that moment? Um, we explore their life goals, the discrepancy where the person is and where they want to be. This is sort of where there is never a bad life goal. If someone, you're working with someone and they say, you know, I want to play in the NFL, um, you, know, you, you can start there because the reality is if, if that's what's motivating them, that big dream, they may not make it to the NFL, but they may find themselves working within the field of football as a coach, as a trainer. Um, but if we shut down that motivation immediately, they don't even get to start to grow in the direction of their dream, right? Um, so we want to, but also if their goal is to play in the NFL and they're skipping football practice, then you would compare those two, those two things, right? Or if uh, they want to play in the NFL, but they're not getting good grades and you know that they've got to go to college first, you know, you can start to explore, well, okay, well, the, it seems like your main value is to get into the NFL, but your behavior is suggesting that you might not even get through high school, right? So being able to bring those into people's awareness is incredibly important. You probably hear chickens screaming in the background. Um, uh, and then we want to emphasize choice and self-determination. We want to constantly be reminding them that they are making choices, that they are determining the course of their life uh, within the structure of those problems, right? Then we wanna reframe the person's negative statement. So it's, if it's like, my gosh, I keep failing all the time. Well, we wanna reframe it uh, into like, you really want some success. It sounds like you're really aching for a win, right? Uh, and so the reframing of those negative statements can start to help them see it in a different way. I use a technique called move your butt, which I'll talk about in a little bit. <laughs> um, so there's a, you're going to see a lot of these, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. But these, uh, all of these abbreviations, find the ones that work for you and integrate them. One of them is the AREDS, uh, the A-R-E-D-S, avoid arguing, roll with resistance, express empathy, develop discrepancies, support self-efficacy. So resistance is a big part of the, the motivation process. So the, the things that we want to know about resistance, because resistance frustrates us so much. We start to label it as lying, manipulation, all these different things. But really what resistance is, is an indication that your approach is not working. All right. So the things we need to understand about resistance are that it is normal. <laughs> we, uh, this, mo this model identifies four main types, arguing, denying, ignoring, interrupting. So you want to be on guard for those things. If you start to feel yourself getting into an argument with your client, that's resistance. If you're bringing something up that you know to be fact and they're denying it, that's a level of resistance. That means you may not have built enough trust, trust for them to bring it in. Um, if they start ignoring you, if they start ignoring the homework from the sessions, they start ignoring their, their actual sessions entirely, um, that's a form of resistance. And then interrupting you constantly breaking through is an indication that the relationship hasn't been formed strong enough. Uh, so the more, this is, this is kind of the paradox of change. The more that we talk about the non-change behaviors, the more likely a person is to do them. If that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so resistance is determined by our style, not theirs. Uh, it may mean that we're ahead of the person in the change process. Sometimes we get excited when we start to make those connections about what the deep underlying issues that the person is having, and we want to put them in the room fast. If we do it too quickly, they'll throw up some of these walls. And, and it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong or it's all ruined. You just want to honor it and then roll with the resistance. A great example 
uh, from my work, I was working with a young man who had his first marijuana offense and I was working in the courts and I had 45 minutes to try to get him to not get arrested for smoking weed in public again. Um, and when I mentioned the, the charge, he said, I don't want to talk about my smoking. And so I rolled with resistance and I said, okay, well, well, what do you want to talk about? You know, what's going on in your life? And he started to talk about his frustration at work and how hard his job was. He was a cook, uh, how much pressure was going on there. And so as we were exploring that, and then finally he goes, and that's why I smoke so much weed. <laughs> so by, by listening to him and, you know, moving my direction, he knew what he was there to talk about. He knew what the main problem was. He just needed me to understand more about his life before he was willing to involve me in the conversation about his weed. All right. So I was ahead of him and his resistance let me know that I was ahead of him. Uh, and a big part of resistance is that, you know, we're, we are afraid of changing because no matter what the problem is, the person is still alive. And sometimes there's a lot of fear that if I stop doing the things that I'm doing, uh, I might lose all of the things that I do have. So honoring what the person stands to lose from changing is a big part of this process. Um, so I'll fly through some of this quickly. So the four types of resistance, uh, you know, contesting the accuracy, expertise, or integrity of the clinician, right? Where'd you go to school? How old are you? Do you even have kids? How can you tell me about my kids if you don't have your kids? Those are indications of resistance. Right? Uh, interrupting, they break in um, or you start to see a lot of defense mechanisms surfacing. That's a form of resistance, right? So keep these things in mind. This is indications that you're going about it in the wrong, in the, in the wrong way. Denying, unwillingness to recognize, cooperate, accept responsibility, or take advice. Ignoring, they show evidence of ignoring or not following the clinician. I had a client once who, were, who would stand on her phone and text message while we were talking. Um, and so the one time I just stopped talking, and then she looked up and she said, you can keep going. I said, I, I wouldn't want to be rude. Uh, I wasn't telling her to put it away, but I was just sharing in that moment what it felt like from my perspective uh, to be doing that, right? But she was ignoring, there was a level of resistance. And what happened next was we started to talk about what was happening in the room between us uh, that was keeping us from being able to really engage. Um, so we use a lot of different skills. One of them is simple reflection. Um, so when somebody brings resistance towards us, we, we, um, we meet it with non-resistance, right? So we acknowledge and validate what the client has said and we move into a different direction. Um, so like the gentleman with the, with the marijuana charge, he said, I don't wanna talk about weed. I said, okay, well, what would you like to talk about? All right, you don't wanna talk about weed. We're not ready for that conversation. Where do you wanna go with this? Uh, we shift focus. We can have used resistance by helping the client move away from the obstacles and barriers. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to affirm our client's personal choices regarding the conduct of their own life, right? We reframe, you know, when somebody's coming at you and they say, oh, how are you gonna help me as a family therapist if you don't have children yourself? You can come back and say, so uh, from your perspective, the only way anyone could help you is if they had the exact same experience. Yeah, okay, well, what if uh, that person had different children, <laughs> right? I can only help you if I have children. Could I help you if I have experience helping other people with children? You know, so you can start to do reframe things like that. Um, a gr good example, because that wasn't a really great example. I was working with a veteran um, and he kept saying, you know, unless you've served, you really can't understand me. And I said, is that a common feeling for you out in the world that uh, the only people who can really see and understand you um, are other, other veterans? And he said, yeah, absolutely. And I said, so is one of the things that you're struggling with is the fact that people out there can't understand what you've been through? He said, yeah, my wife especially. I said, okay, well, what if we use our relationship to explore ways to communicate that information? Like we can keep doing it. If you could get me to understand it, you might be able to get other people to understand it. So that's reframing the resistance into something that could be useful. And then the follow-up question is, so what has to exist in our relationship for us to start that process? Uh, so role with resistance, understanding that resistance is energy. And it is change energy. It's them telling you that your approach isn't working. That's important data. So we can use that motivation and that enter the momentum to move in a different direction. Um, when we do these things, the reframing, all those, their perceptions start to get shifted. They start to see you as maybe you can help, 
Maybe I can share a little bit more. Maybe I can bring up the weed in that one ex experience. Um, new ex uh, perspectives are invited, but not imposed, right? So it's a gentle way of bringing people around to see a different way. Sort of like what I was talking about with the veteran. Um, the client is the valuable resource in finding the problems, right? So if you have, if, if I can't understand you because I haven't been where you've been, you have the resource that we need to start helping you communicate with the world. That's a skill. That's a power. Uh, the other one is siding with the negatives. Uh, so a, a great way to do this is, and you can overemphasize it in a lot of ways, right? So you know, I had a client once who was talking really badly about his mother. And I said, wow, you really hate your mom. And he said, I don't hate my mom. I love my mom. I said, oh, because when you said all those terrible things about her, I got the impression that you hated her. No, I don't hate her. I'm just angry. And that person just self-regulated their experience, right? And they clarified to me what was happening in there, right? Um, so the next thing we move into is ambivalence. So we talked about rolling with resistance. That's a big part of what we do. The next thing is we identify ambivalence. And what we mean by that is it's a state of mind in which the person has coexisting but conflicting feelings about something. I want to, but I don't want to. Um, a, a really big one in... Um, Substance use treatment is, you know, I really want to be sober, but I keep relapsing. We have to understand that ambivalence is, is, is the most important phase of the process of change, because this is actually where a person is having an argument with themselves about the change. It's just usually they're doing it in their own mind, so they don't get the feedback. They don't get help in working out the decision. They're sort of stuck just with their own history stuck with their own thoughts, stuck with their own feelings. If, if we can get them to a place where they trust us to bring us into that process, well, now they have another perspective. They have someone who's watching chess from the side of the board and can see some of the moves um, that they're missing. Uh, it's a normal aspect of human nature. It is not pathological. So we don't want to uh, diagnose ambivalence. And it's the key to resolving the change. It is our friend. <laughs> Uh, and what we do with, uh, we talked about this earlier, what we do with the ambivalence is we look for the discrepancy, the difference between their core values and their current behavior, um, where they are now and where they want to be. You know, evaluate their current state with regards to their goals and then emphasize the discrepancy between the two. We talked a lot about that. Um, so the assessment tools. This is how we try to figure out how to uh, scale our intervention. The first is to have a good understanding of the theoretical stages of change. Uh, the second is the use of what we call the payoff matrix. Then we have the ICR scales, which is how we help them decide whether or not they're ready. And then we use value cards to identify those intrinsic values. And this, we don't, it doesn't necessarily uh, go in that order. Um, so these are, this is the theoretical stages of change model that everyone, they do a lot of research to find that everyone kind of follows this pattern when we make a change. We go from pre-contemplation contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and then relapse can occur anywhere. It's sort of an outside uh, stage. Um, the easiest way for me to, to, to illustrate this to me is, uh, is weight loss or weight gain, right? So if somebody's um, wanting to, to lose weight, um, before they're really even thinking about it, they're in that pre-contemplation stage, just going through life, uh, eating the way that they want to, exercising the way that they want to, nothing is really happening. Um, and then some event happens, right? So maybe they have a conversation with their doctor. Um, maybe, you know, clothes are starting to feel a little bit tight or too loose. Uh, maybe the doctor is telling them that their recent weight loss is, you know, complicating issues with their heart. Something brings into their awareness that the behavior is causing some type of problem. Once they hit that, then they move into contemplation. This is where the person is like, all right, well, do I really need to gain the weight? Do I really need to lose the weight? Do I need to make this change? Does it, um, does it fit into my worldview? Do I have time to do it? Um, this is now the time, all of those things. And once the person decides that, yes, I do want to make this change, then we move into preparation. And preparation is sort of them deciding, all right, do I need to work with a nutritionist? Do I need to get a personal trainer? Um, do I want to take medication to help? Uh, can I do this on my own? Should I get a P90X video? Like, what, what is it going to look like? This is the big part for us. We become sort of the maitre d'. We want to have a menu of options for them to choose from and try out. Uh, then once they feel good about their, prep, their prepared plan, we move into action. Action is sort of like the first, the first meal on the new meal plan, or the first time that they step foot in the gym, or whatever the, whatever the preparation stage was. 
it's that uh, initial um, trying out phase. Uh, then after we've done it long enough and it starts to really integrate into who we are, we start looking at maintenance level skills, making sure that we understand what those flags, the, the minefield flags are, the things that can take us off our plan, all those types of things. And then relapse or reoccurrence is my preferred word. Um, and our job there is to remind them that it's part of the process uh, and that it's, it, as long as they survive it and they get back, it's helpful to where we are. So in regards to the losing or gaining weight, you know, relapse can be something as simple as a piece of cake. If I've lost 30 pounds on my weight loss plan and I eat a piece of cake, I don't gain the 30 pounds back. But if I stay in the reoccurrence long enough, that's when uh, I lose the gains that I made and sometimes things get even worse. Uh, the payoff matrix, this is a really unique, this works really great in groups, it works great in individual therapy, and it goes with any change. I've used this for folks who want to quit smoking cigarettes, people who are trying to get off of heroin, uh, people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia and don't want to take their medication. Uh, because what this does is it's sort of a pro-con, pro-con list where you're looking at the pros of not changing, you're looking at the pros of changing, you're looking at the cons or the costs of changing, uh, but you're also looking at the cons of not changing, right? So you can kind of see how that looks in here. Um, so this, this is adapted specifically about drinking, but you could very easily, where it says drinking as before, um, just put uh, pros of not changing. And then the sec abstaining would be pros of changing. Benefits, you could just see um, of each of those things, right? So the ICR, uh, for whatever reason, the label at the top didn't come across, but um, ICR is a way that we really want to, we want to gauge where the person is at with the change. So if it's like, you know, this week I'm, I'm going to that AA meeting, you'd say, all right, well, how important is it for you to get to that AA meeting scale of one to 10? Well, it's like a six, okay? How confident are you? That's the C. How confident are you that you're going to get there? Like an eight. Okay, how ready are you to make that change in your life right now? I'm like a four. Well, those numbers give you something to work for because then you want to say if it's a four, how do we get it to a five? If it's a four, what makes it not a three? You want to sort of really explore each of those intrinsic values. And then the value cards I'll, I'll send to you, but basically they're a stack of values that you have people sort into three columns. Not important, important, very important. And so you have them go through all of them and put them in piles then you as the counselor, you take away the not important and the important and you leave them with very important and you have them sort them into those three columns again. And you continue that process until they're down to at least three. The goal is to get them down to one, but uh, it can be very emotional for folks as they start to get closer and closer to the different, um, to the different final values. Uh, a listening, strengthening, confidence talk. So we talked a lot about these, but Again, this is evocative questions, the confidence ruler, which is we just talked about, reviewing past successes, personal strength supports, brainstorming. This is what, this is what the, um, the session looks like, right? Giving information and advice as part of the process, reframing the resistance, and then hypothetical change, helping them imagine, sort of going back to that miracle question. <clears throat> so the confidence ruler, we've talked about this, zero to 10, you know, how confident are you? Um, why a four, not a one? We just talked about that. So here's another one of these lists. So another way of sort of thinking about the work that we do is the A rows, just like we had the A reds before. Affirmations, reflective listening, open-ended questions, summaries, elicit change talk. So that's what a session would look like, right? Um, so reflective listening, it allows the person to feel heard. It allows you to confirm perceptions. Uh, we use simple declarative statements. It wasn't your idea to come see me today. If they're like, the judge sent me here, uh, you feel pretty discouraged right now. You know, I've been in treatment 10,000 times and it's never worked. You have mixed feelings about your drug use, you know. <clears throat> so you can see how that reflective listening, you're allowing them to hear it, but you're kind of changing the energy of where it comes from. Um, you, a lot of therapists use a lot of these. So I'm hearing this, uh, it sounds like you're saying that, um, but these things really do work to gain clarity and to get, gain a good understanding. Um, so the strategies to get at the change talk, evocative questions, readiness rulers, decisional balance, looking back, looking forward, hypotheticals and key questions. So um, 
so one of the skills that we're trying to build is self-efficacy. And that's the belief that they can actually do the thing. Belief in the possibility of change. Uh, enforcing the idea that the client is responsible for choosing and carrying out their own personal changes and that there's hope in the range of alternative approaches so that you know, there's a lot of different ways to the top of the mountain. So if somebody's in preparation and they move into action and it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that the individual failed. It just means that that one plan didn't work the way we thought it would. So we go back and we start the preparation process again. So we want to avoid arguments uh, they're incredibly counterproductive. They breed defensiveness. Uh, they are a level of resistance. Uh, and labeling the person's behavior is unnecessary. Just like I said last week, saying, <clears throat> you know, someone's manipulative or a liar, there's really no clinical value to those statements. We want the open-ended question so that the person has to think through the answer. It's not as easy as just yes or no's. Uh, reflective listening is a great way of checking rather than assuming. Like when I said, you really hate your mother, that was reflective listening and he was able to correct the record. Uh, expressing empathy. Um, this allows them to feel accepted while supporting the process. Um, acceptance of oneself, acceptance by the therapist facilitates change because it makes the person feel uh, more free and engaged. Um, we seek to build up rather than tear down. We're always trying to look at the, 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 the way that we can make our clients feel better about themselves. Uh, skillful reflective listening um, is a great way of expressing that empathy to our clients. Uh, we've talked a lot about that. Um, yeah, so we talked a lot about these. You can certainly look these over and it'll all make sense. Uh, trapped to avoid is a premature focus. That kind of means going into the session thinking you know what needs to happen. If I'd gone in with that young man in the court uh, and focused completely on the weed even after he, if he had said that and I said, yeah, well, that's what you're here for, buddy. So that's what we're going to talk about. We never would have gotten to any real type of change conversation. We don't want to confront people because that builds up. We do want to, to bring things into awareness but we don't want to do it in an aggressive con uh, confrontational way. Uh, we don't want to label their behavior as good or bad. Um, we, we just want it to be able to be behavior that was either, that either worked or didn't work. Right. Uh, no blaming. You know, we don't want to put the focus on that. Um, and we don't want to get into the question answer trap where they're asking us questions and we're just giving them answers. Um, so this is kind of what the assessment, we want to assess the, client's perspective of the problem, look for their discrepancies, normalize and validate their perspective while at the same time lending insight. Uh, the goal is to see where they are in the process of change and then to treatment plan from that phase. So what happens a lot that's very frustrating for clients and clinicians is that we'll often give someone an action intervention when they're still in pre-contemplation. So if somebody comes in and they're not even convinced they have a, a drug problem, why would I ever send them to an AA meeting? You know, I need to work on helping them recognize uh, if and how their substance use is problematic and then help them figure out what would be the most meaningful action step once they get to that phase. Um, the goal, yeah, so that's all that. <laughs> all right, so uh, that was a lot of information. I I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. Hopefully some of the tools and things were helpful. Uh, right now I wanna give you an example of a way that, uh, that I use this with a client. So. I think I mentioned a little bit about this client in class, but uh, this was a client, I was working at Bellevue Hospital. So he's a 42 year old, heterosexual white male, cisgendered, single, never married with one daughter who was 14, uh, who he had no contact with. Um, he was domiciled in a shelter at the time of admission, um, but at the time of the presentation that I gave and the last time I talked to him, he was in permanent veterans housing in, uh, in the Bronx of New York. He was a combat veteran from the Somalia War he had a diagnosis, and so this was uh, from the DSM-4. I don't change this because he was never re-diagnosed through the DSM-5, so this is just what his diagnosis looked like. He was diagnosed with PTSD, polysubstance dependence. Uh, the multiple drugs were alcohol, benzodiazepines, cocaine, and opiates. He also had a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. So he was well known to Bellevue Hospital. He was a member of our uh, hospital to home program and the chronic public inebriates program, a terrible, terrible term. But what those two programs did was people who were using the emergency room a lot um, were sent to these programs and they got additional assistance in case management. 
He had a history of numerous hospitalizations for mental health and drug-related issues. Between October of 09 and August of 2012, he was admitted to our hospital 154 times. Uh, over 120 of those admissions were to the emergency room. Several of them were readmissions to the same day. And he had a very similar presentation at two other hospitals. He was referred to, CDOP was the name of the clinic I worked in, the chemical dependency outpatient, uh, by one of our inpatient psychiatric units after he had been there for a one month stay. That one month is significant because um, in order to be kept that long, the condition is incredibly, incredibly serious and compromised. Uh, he was admitted to our program on August 7th, 2012, and remained in treatment until he completed. He had his first experience with drug and alcohol treatment at the age of 16, new numerous treatment episodes with varied results. So the big takeaway from this is that this was not his first rodeo. <laughs> um, he had an extensive forensic history, including a history of violence, drug-related incarcerations, extensive history of homelessness, including street-level homelessness. So by the time he arrived in my office, uh, he had been through it all. I mean, from the time he was 16 on, he'd been pushed into treatment after treatment after treatment. Um, so when I first met him, it was really important for me to figure out where he was in that stage of change for him. So in my initial interview with him, uh, I was really just trying to get an, a deeper understanding of what he identified as the problem. Um, so he had a lot of things that he would have liked to have done, but he wasn't taking a lot of action to get them. Like he was a veteran, but he refused to use any of his veteran benefits, even the ones that would have secured him housing. Um, he was incredibly resistant to engaging in that because of interpersonal relationships that he had had. Uh, so these are, I'm going to fly through these because we already talked about this. Uh, this is a different way of doing it. Like we had all those other breakdowns, but the darn C, this is sort of six different types of change talk, desire, ability, reasons, need, and commitment. So we're always looking for when somebody says, I want to, but, or I would like to, I can, or I could, I should, because I need to, I will. The big thing is that we want to get to is number five, commitment, right? A lot of people come in with desire, but they don't feel like they, they really have the ability or they're not sure of the reasons why, um, or they can identify the need but not the want. When, they, when we can synthesize one through four, we get to five. Right? So um, for, for this guy, uh, the importance ruler was incredibly important. He had a very analytical mind. So when he would come in and start complaining about something and I would put it on that one to 10 scale, he loved that. And so he started to use that himself. He would bring it into sessions and tell me where he was. Um, so I'm gonna skip past this when we talk about this. Um, so at the end of the assessment that we did with the guy, it was clear he was in the contemplation stage. So he recognized that the drugs, the alcohol, the PTSD were causing problems, but he didn't wanna work on it. His resistance stemmed from all of those failed attempts and a belief that he was beyond help. For him, the main problem was him. I'm just a broken person. And he would say, you know, I want a better life, but it's just too late. You know, so uh, I would, in, I use this thing called move your butt, um, because I find that, that when the negative is the end of the sentence, that's the energy and emotion we have. So when I say I want a better life, but it's too late, that's ending on hopelessness. So I would tell him when he would talk like this, <clears throat> I'd say, move your butt. And he'd say, it feels like it's too late, but I want a better life. So he was ending the sentence on the hope, right? So this is a way of listening for change talk and then using the reframing process. Um, so there was a lot of resistance from him. <clears throat> and the most effective thing I could ever do is to roll with it, to acknowledge that he might not want to talk about something given everywhere that he had been in his life, uh, and then allowing him to direct the conversation in the areas that he wanted to. Um, so we got to this preparation stage after he really contemplated it. We looked at the pros and the cons. Uh, he started to experience a different feeling working with me than he had felt with other counselors. We entered into brainstorming and, and preparation is where we're, we're brainstorming the best course of action. We want to focus on what the client thinks is possible, not us. Then moving into action, assisting them with taking steps towards it, helping them remove barriers where we can. Maintenance help them identify new strategies for change. <clears throat> so with this guy, I wanted him to realize that uh, even though in a lot of the treatment settings he'd been in, they told him that there was, it was their way or the highway, that there were actually a lot of other options uh, to get to the top of the mountain, to get that sobriety that he wanted, or to deal with the PTSD symptoms, that there was more than just you know, AA and the VA. 
Um, so our, my job was to have a menu and then for him to decide what off of the menu was going to help him climb the mountain. So for him, CBT was, was what he chose. Uh, he was drawn to the collaborative process because he felt like an equal. He loved the psychoed part. He always wanted to go on for college. He dreamed of being a scientist. So the psychoed aspect of CBT felt really good for him. He'd oftentimes say, you know, I feel, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm in college when, when we do the sessions or when, when, when I'm in your group. So it played to that in, in tech, intellectual side. It was new. He had never experienced it before. I remember after one of our CBT groups, he pulled me aside. And he said, Steve, I'm really mad. I said, well, what do you, what, where's the anger from? He said, I've been trying to get sober since I was 16, and this is the first time I ever heard this. So there was hope in the newness of it. And the other piece was that he experienced it in a group that I ran, and then he brought it to me in the individual sessions and said, I want to do the CBT. So what we did was we used CBT in a trauma framework. And so the way that, uh, that trauma therapy works is it goes through three stages, safety, mourning, and connection. So safety means helping the person feel safe within their symptoms, safe within their skin, safe within their world. So you start with safety in the room. Like what is it about the, the room that we're practicing in? How does it make you feel? So he and I rearranged the furniture. We changed some lighting. He got to choose his seat before I sat down. All these different things that we could make very, uh, obvious choices about within the room. Uh, then session uh, safety within the sessions was allowing him to direct the conversations where he wanted them to go. Then we started to use that to make him feel more comfortable in groups and, and in the community as a whole. And then after that would be to work on feeling safe out in the world. Once you really establish safety with the person, you move into the mourning phase. And with this client at the time of this presentation, we were just beginning that. And mourning is where you actually start having conversations about the trauma itself. Uh, and then after that, you work on reconnection where the person can return to the people, places, and things that were previously triggering. Uh, so we used a lot of experimentation. We did a lot of breath work. We would do, we would try it in sessions, then he would take it into home. Uh, grounding work, I'm sorry about the format of this page, it didn't transfer over well from, uh, from my computer to the Mac. But um, so we, we did a lot of breath work. He really liked the mindfulness concepts that I, I kind of incorporated into CBT because those are part of the trauma-informed work. Um, then the rubber had to meet the road. Um, we got to the action stage. So he had gone through preparation. He was all ready. He had tried some things out in sessions. He was starting to feel safe in his symptoms. And then Superstorm Sandy hit New York City. And because at the time I was a temp employee um, at Bellevue because they were in a hiring freeze. So the only way they could hire new people was as temps. So all of the temps got laid off. <coughs> um, and it was the day he was going to take over his apartment. We'd finally gotten to the point where he got his VA benefits established. So the day the storm happened was the first day that he was going off to live on his own. So it was a huge rupture in our relationship. They had to close Bellevue Hospital down and move our clinic to one room in Metropolitan Hospital. <clears throat> now, uh, is that hospital, he had died in three times. He'd been kicked out of by the police. He had all sorts of terrible memories inside of Metropolitan Hospital. It was occurring at the same time of the major life change. And once he moved in, his neighbor played Call of Duty, the video game on surround sound in the studio apartment right next to his. And we were separated for six months. So I was probably more afraid of what was going on with him than he was. Um, but the results were that he maintained his sobriety for the entire time, continued to work on his goals uh, of getting um, his health issues. He had hepatitis C. He finally sought treatment for it, continued to work on his goals in regards to maintaining his home, uh, building his network of supports, re-engaging with the veteran community. <clears throat> he used his coping skills in dealing with the neighbor and in dealing with going into the hospital. Um, he continued to, tend to attend the clinic, even though it was in that triggering place. And he advocated for himself appropriately in regards to his neighbor, and he got his room moved so that he felt safer in the space. And he ended up becoming friends with that next door neighbor. <laughs> um, he moved, eventually as we worked together, he moved into the maintenance phase. He was, he uh, did not have a single relapse while he was a member of our program. Uh, he had significant reduction in his PTSD symptoms. This was a person who would freeze up when he would hear loud noises. He would constantly rock back and forth when he sat in his chairs. 
He had a facial t twitch, uh, all sorts of things. And I'd say probably 85 to 90% of those symptoms were gone by the time he left treatment. He went from feeling like there was no hope based on his past to feeling like there was nothing but hope based on his future. Uh, he changed his belief about his ability to change because he saw himself doing the work. And he had zero emergency room visits for the entire year and a half that he was with us. Um, so at the end of my, uh, my presentation, uh, because this client was so well known, all of the doctors in the room, you know, had their mouths to the floor because they couldn't believe that, because they knew who the guy was just by his presentation. Uh, so at the end, I asked them, how many counselors does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to be motivated to change. <laughs> um, so there's some of the resources there. So let me stop my share here. Um, so um, so I, I hope that that kind of put into perspective sort of what this work can sometimes look like. Uh, MI feels very simple. It feels very basic. Um, the skills that are involved in it are involved in every level of good communication. Hopefully in your own personal relationships, you do a lot of the MI stuff. But in motivational interviewing, and I hope this is what came through in the presentation, is that in MI, we're doing those things at specific times for specific purposes. Uh, it's incredibly effective as a handoff technology. You can't do motivational interviewing for two years of therapy, but you can do motivational interviewing and when somebody gets to that preparation stage and chooses CBT or psychotherapy or DBT or EFT, or whatever makes sense for them at that moment, um, then you hand that off to the new theory. So it's a great way to get people engaged, to keep them in treatment, to help them start to achieve um, success so that they feel that motivation and that will to keep going. And then you can hand it off to um, a larger theoretical approach if need be. For some people, just going through the process is enough. Um, so uh, I will upload the documents that I mentioned in here. I will upload this, the PowerPoint that went along with this so that you can go through, print it out, take notes as you're listening to the lecture, whatever you choose to do. Um, I'll open up a discussion board tonight and you will be able to um, put any questions, the answers to that one slide question about what values within the ethical canon am I bumps up against. Uh, and then hopefully the next time that we see each other, uh, we can start with an interesting conversation about some of the stuff that this presentation brought up for you. I know that this was a very long uh, session, um, so I appreciate everybody sticking with me. Uh, you can watch it in intervals, of course. Um, and I'll see you next time in class. All right, take care.